Good afternoon. It's so great to have you all here. And I'm actually happy to be here, too. I asked the judge yesterday when I was four hours in jury duty if I could please come tonight so that I could be here to, to address you all. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. So tonight we are going to talk about aquaculture. And let's get started. So what's going to happen in 2050? So more people, right? So we know right now on planet Earth, we have about 7.5 billion people, plus or minus 200 million. So it's close to that. And I don't know if you knew, but since really human history, which started 200,000 years ago, that's when the first 1 billion people populated the Earth. And then it took another 200 years after that to build us up to that 7.5, to add that other 6.5. And it actually took one, or it took 12 years to build that last billion into that uh, 7.5. So by 2050, we will be adding about 2.3 billion people. So that's in the next 30, 30, 32 years. So that will take us to 10 billion people which is quite a lot of people. And so now, not only do we have a lot of people on Earth, we now know that we need to feed the people. So the challenge that we have for this planet is that we must produce more food in the next four, three to four decades than all the food that the farmers have produced over the last 8,000 years. So that's like, that's like mind-blowing to me as well. And this is a photograph, actually, from, um, from Holland, where they have a lot of advancement in intensive farming methods. So what are our choices? How are we going to feed the future? We can certainly continue to do intensive agriculture. But we also need to look at the oceans. And we need to look at what we call the perfect protein, which is the fish and all the seafood that comes out of the ocean. Why is seafood so perfect? It's because it contains omega-3s. It's the only food that we eat that has such a high, rich source of omega-3s. We can eat almonds and flax seeds, and there's a little bit of omega-3s in some of the uh, other types of foods that we eat. But really, when it comes down to it, it's our seafood that's so important to us. It's critical to our health. It's critical to the, the newborn that's being the, the fetal development and the maintenance of our brain, our mental health, also our retina and our heart, our immune system. We always hear about eating fish that's healthy for our heart. So how are we going to have enough fish to feed the world in 2050? So right now, we know that if you look at the fish up the top here, and you add those two numbers together, we're either overexploited or near saturation in the amount of fishing that we're taking from the ocean. And so if you look at this graph here, you can see wild captured fisheries, and you can see aquaculture. So it's the combination of those two that's helping to feed us. And if you look back in, really, back in about the 1990s, that's when fisheries started to plateau. So we can only take so much protein out of the ocean. And that's when aquaculture, or aquaculture which is, is the equivalent of agriculture, but it's done with water, right? Both fresh water and also salt water. That's when aquaculture really took off. And so if you look down the road at 2050, you can see 9.8 billion, 10 billion people. You can see aquaculture is needed even more because our fisheries is plateaued or it maybe even slightly goes down. So it's going to be this nice balance, really, or a very critical balance between sustainable fisheries and also aquaculture that's going to allow us to continue to eat what we call the perfect protein. So I got to thinking about this. How do we really visualize how much seafood that is? So a Volkswagen weighs a ton, right? So we're, I'm talking about it's going to take 154 million Volkswagens 
to eco 154 million tons of seafood. Just to give you an idea of the capacity of how much seafood we harvest on an annual basis every year. So that's just to give you another idea. That's 60% of all the cars in the US is how much seafood we all eat globally around the planet. So when you say that's a lot of seafood, <laughs> that's a lot of seafood. So it's really going to take a combination. And these ideas at Harbor Branch have been percolating for some time. And it's really in some recent days discussions with our executive director, who you heard last week speak, Anton Post, we got to thinking, how are we going to feed the future? How are we going to feed the future when we know that we have a collapsing fisheries? And we know that here in the United States, we have what we call a trade deficit. We actually import almost 90% of our seafood. So that's a lot of seafood we're bringing in. So we got this really interesting combination of things that are going on right now in order to put them together to make it possible for us to have more seafood. So here at Harbor Branch, we've actually been doing aquaculture here at Harbor Branch for almost 50 years. And in the last 20 years, we, we developed what we call the Aquaculture Development Park. And in our park, we do exactly that. We take aquaculture, we um, figure out how to grow fish and clams and shrimp and seaweeds and everything in between so that we can get the industry going and help it grow. And so that's exactly what we're doing here at Harbor Branch. And I'll talk a little bit more about it as, as we um, move on with the presentation. But I want to let you know that we're looking for solutions. And we've been doing that for the last 40 years. And some of you may have heard from Paul Wills and Susan Laramore, who are both in our aquaculture area, and about some of the different types of, of aquaculture we do here to advance the industry. So today, what I'd like to do is concentrate on, well, let me just uh, step back a second. We have aquaculture, which is the farming of, of seafood and plants and animals. And we have something that's called a fed species. So the fed species are species that you actually have to make pellets and feed them, just like you feed your dog and your cat. And um, you know there's fish feed that's up on. If any of you have ponds or anything, you know you can buy fish feed and feed them. Well, those those species here, like tilapia and striped bass, catfish, salmon, trout, shrimp, they all need little pellets, and those pellets require also the harvesting sometimes of other seafood in order to get the fish meal and the and the fish oils, or it could be proteins that are from soy or things like that. But anyway, they need to be fed. And then on the other side of it, we have what's called the non-fed species. And they actually live in their environment, and they eat what's in their environment. So for instance, the clams, they are filter feeders. So they feed off of the phytoplankton that's in the water. And the same with the mussels, the same with the oysters. And then there's also the algae that picks up the nutrients. So it doesn't require a pellet. So that, that's why we call it the, the non-fed species. So today, we're going to concentrate on this side of the slide. And why is it so exciting to be working with non-fed species? Um, first of all, um, they are what we call low on the food web. So you know they're at the bottom, essentially. So they provide a very important niche in the environment. The, the oysters and the clams and the, and the mussels, they all filter out nutrients and help clean the water. And so they're very good for the environment. And about half of the world's aquaculture comes from these non-fed species. They actually are a little uh, less expensive to grow. And so you can have more of it. So um, I'm hoping today that for all of you that may not have eaten seaweed or eaten clams, that you might get very interested in these non-fed types of aquaculture species that are eating natural foods and taking in natural nutrients from the water. So we're, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the clams. And so these clams, some of you from the north might know them as cohogs, right? Um, they grow really big. And actually, I tried to get some to show you, but um, they're all frozen. Like I went to the fish market yesterday, and he said, but actually, there's ice. Is this possible, ice 
in the salt water on the shore? Like, I've never seen that before. You've seen it go solid. Okay. So they couldn't get to the clam, um, so I couldn't bring you any quahogs to show you, but they're usually the big chowder clams that are known as quahogs. But they're also known as, what, chowder clams, little necks, middle necks, count necks, cherry stones, etc. So they have lots of different names. Um, but we're going to work with those today. You're going to get to learn a lot about the clam. So if you're going to buy a clam, because um, I always like to help you with some little tips here, and we'll, we'll go into this a little bit more, but here's some clam. They came in a mesh bag, and I had to keep them in the refrigerator, and I had to let them breathe. Like, you don't want to seal them up. So if you buy clams from the seafood market, make sure that you put them in your fridge and you let them be open. Okay, so they like to be, so don't put them on ice because you don't want them to get into the water. And let's see, and you shouldn't buy any clams if they're open, like really open. They're going to gape a little bit, and these are starting to do that because they're getting warm. And I'll show you that, but if they're really gaping, you, you don't want to get them. So where are clams found, and how do we regulate which waters they can come from? Well, this is Florida. With all, all the numbers here are all regulated water areas. So if you go to the website and you look up shellfish harvesting areas, you'll find this map. And you can go to the different areas. And so, for instance, in Indian River County, right here, um, we're number 70. Right? And 72 here. So this is the, in the Indian River water. So you can see that the Indian River St. Lucie area is open. But then there's another section that's closed. And that's probably because it gets too much fresh water. It gets algal blooms there. It might be too high in nutrients. It might have a red tide. So that's how they make a decision. And, and there's, um, the agencies are out there all the time making sure that these waters are safe to harvest the clams. And then in the northern part, which is more like up in the Grant area, Sebastian Grant area, there's one area that's, that's open, but it's conditionally approved. And that means that it's approved only if, it's, if there hasn't been a lot of rainfall and a lot of runoff or there, um, uh, things like that. So just to give you an idea, um, when you go to this website, you, see, you find the site, and then you find which area it is, and then they tell you conditionally approved. So this is actually, um, here's the Sebastian River, right? There's 512, if you know 512, Sebastian River. So you can see that this patched area here is the conditionally approved from Grant and Sebastian, and conditionally restricted areas, prohibited areas. So they break the map up. And you can do that all over, the, all over Florida. You can find out where your clams came from. So for instance, these clams that we're going to eat today and, and work with today came from Cedar Key, which is on the west coast of Florida. So they're from up in this area. See the blue area there? And they're actually from number 30. And that's in conditionally approved waters. And they close those waters only if there's been 6.67 inches of rain. So very precise, right? OK, so clams in our state are so important. They're second on the list. You can see ornamental fish is first on the list. Clams is the number one food item that is produced in aquaculture in our state. And then just to give you a couple of other ideas of things that are grown, you've got the alligators. You've got aquatic plants that are more for ornamental uses. Um, other food fish, tilapia, catfish, et cetera. So there's about 400 farmers in the, for all of the aquaculture that's going on in our state. And it's close to a $7 million industry. Sometimes it jumps up to $100 million. So clams right now is somewhere around $12 million industry. But it has been as high as 20. So it fluctuates in that range. I'm going to show you a little video about how clams are grown. and getting them ready to go on the spawning table. 
where they're going to spawn. And they have that nice music, and they set the candles, and they have the glass of wine, and they really hope that it's, that's going to do the trick. So he's starting to warm them up because they've been in a cool tank for a while. And it's on a recirculation, and it's, you can see the heater there, so it's warming up the water. And now the water is going to start to flow over the clam. And, he's, and Freddie's also taking a little bit of warm water with some sperm in it to make sure that the temperature and the stimulant of the sperm will actually help, help to enhance them to start bleeding. Okay, see their siphons now? That's, oh, look at that. So this is a male, and the males always go first. So you can see the, the sperm that's coming out. You can see it's very milky. This is the female. So she lays, she produces eggs in clumps. So that's how you tell the difference between the male and the female. So look at all those hundreds of thousands of eggs there. Millions of eggs there. There they go. Now that's a good spawn. That's a great spawn. And now what they're going to do is pour the eggs through the screen into the bucket. bit more. So lots of eggs go in. And then just a tiny bit of sperm go in. That's all you need. Just a couple pipettes for it. And that's enough to fertilize all those eggs that are in there. And mix it up. Really highly scientific. And then she's looking under the microscope to make sure that they've been fertilized. And then once she's um, sure that they've been fertilized, they go into these large larval tanks. And then every other day they get screened down, and that's, that's millions of clams right there. And they get hosed down, and they get put into the, the bucket that's next to the Freddy's foot there. a lot of clams, right? That's what they look like microscopically. They take about two weeks, about two weeks to grow until they're no longer a larvae and that they become a juvenile. There they are as juveniles. They have their little foot and they're moving around. That's the foot that you end up eating as part of the, the clam. And then we put them in these baskets here. And that seed clam right there. This is a project that we did during the, during the 90s, um, during the retraining of the fishermen up in Cedar Key, also in Volusia County, down in Pine Island, and we retrained fishermen to be clam farmers. And so you can see how the clams are grown out on a lease site, so as soon as the little seeds are ready, they get put in mesh bags and they completely get put on, on the bottom of the water, on the substrate, in these mesh bags. And you go, there's your clam, cedar de clam. So just a little bit more about our retraining programs. The Harbor Branch was very instrumental working with also with um, University of Florida Sea Grant in retraining over 500 fishermen to be clam farmers. And it was a year-long program that we had it at, we had it in several areas of, the, of, of Florida as you can see. And that's what started the clam industry here in our state is because of all the retraining that we did um, with, with the fishermen. And so it's, it's a very successful business. Each fisherman got an acre of land, acre of submerged land, which they could plant a million clams. And we also here at Harbor Branch, we grew the little baby seeds of the seed um, clam. And we, we provided those to the fishermen as well. And the way that we knew it was successful was the number of pickup trucks that started to show up uh, in the state of Florida or in the clam, clamming areas. And so it really is, is a booming industry um, in our state. Let's see. 
Um, this just gives you an idea of the different areas and the number of, of clam farms in each of the area. But we did talk about Indian River area, Charlotte Harbor, Cedar Key, and then up in the Panhandle are the main areas where, where you'll find clams grown in our state. So I'm happy to announce, this is like breaking news. We have um, just signed an agreement with a company called Sea Venture Clam Company. And we will be having um, a public-private partnership here on our site to grow more clams. So we're going to um, have uh, reinstate our, our hatchery here and be able to produce um, hundreds of thousands, actually millions of clams here to help continue to boost the industry in our state of Florida. So we're really quite excited to, to break the news to you um, today. Such good news. All right, so we're going to switch gears. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I really love seaweed. I, <laughs> I'm thinking about getting lots of shirts like that made. Um, so how many of you love seaweed or eat seaweed? Maybe you don't love it, but you eat it? OK, a few of you, yeah. So it's great. So I've loved seaweed for a really long time. I've loved seaweed on the east coast of the United States up in Maine. And I've loved seaweed just more recently when I was over at, near Seattle in the Lopez Islands, San Juan Islands. And um, I was tasting every seaweed I could get my hands on. So um, we're going to talk a lot about seaweed um, this evening or this afternoon as well. Why do I love seaweed so much? They are, they are so rich in minerals. Um, there's, if you really look at seaweed, it's grown in seawater. And seawater is very close to the chemistry of our blood. So if you eat seaweed, it means that you're eating the nutrients and the minerals that our body needs. And so there's probably not a day that goes by that I don't eat seaweed. And so these are just some of the, the different types of things that you can find uh, in seaweed. So I have a really cool video to show you about seaweed, um, of course, right? So this is, this is kelp. Um, in the Pacific, which is uh, uh, a great seaweed to also eat. Um, but I just wanted to show you the richness of the kelp forest because they're so beautiful. And this is a story about the north coast of Maine is the scenic backdrop for a rare kind of harvest. You see that nice honey colored right up through here? The crop here is seaweed, and for nearly two decades now, Ron Hinkel has made a living carefully pruning the plants in these waters. It's kind of like, you could think of it kind of like a garden, is the more I the cut it and keep it clean and, and, and nipped up, the, the better and the better the seaweed is every year. You know, it's better and better. It comes and goes by names like digitata, labor, dulse, and bladderwrack. As many as eight types of seaweed are native to this stretch of the Atlantic coast. Last year we harvested 100,000 pounds of this stuff to get 10,000 dried pounds at the end. That's a lot of work too, you know. Hinkle does the heavy lifting, but it was the failing health of this man's wife that turned these sea vegetables into a business. We discovered it one day at a picnic down by the beach. Seaweed was one of the dietary changes suggested for his wife, but imported seaweed was costly. So Shep Earhart took a chance on sea vegetables from the waters of Maine. Luckily, somebody said, well, you know, why don't you change your diet and see what happens? And uh, we started eating seaweed, and it made all the difference. This admitted hippie of the 60s pioneered drying technique and sold his first batches by word of mouth in brown paper bags. As the business grew, Maine Coast Sea Vegetables found itself shipping seaweed across the U.S. and overseas. But the seaweed became more of a passion when we realized that there are a lot of people in the cities who don't have access to this that really appreciate it and find it a vital part of their diet. Asian countries have touted the benefits of seaweed for thousands of years, and many who consume sea vegetables claim significant health benefits. So now we're going to switch gears and go to Harbor Branch so you can see how we grow seaweed here. Very large tanks. We have sea water from our recirculating system full of nutrients. This is all the sea lettuce. You get 
har again, harvested on a weekly basis. Now's So, um, I know, Dennis loves seaweed. Dennis, thank you so much for all the seaweeds that you grow and, um, and your team. And today we're actually going to be doing some recipes uh, with the seaweed that we grow. So, um, they do harvest the seaweed, like I said, once a week, each of these tanks has about uh, 30 to 40 pounds of seaweed, wet weight seaweed that's uh, harvested. I think that's Richard and Patrick. We got Paul up there harvesting seaweed, but you can see this is called sea lettuce. It's a very thin seaweed. Um, it's very green. It's the, really the greenest of all seaweeds that, that, um, that are edible. And um, so I, I'm hoping that I uh, can get you to fall in love with sea lettuce today. So what was interesting when I was doing a little searching around and I went to Maine uh, Coast Sea Vegetables where you just saw the video and they do sell ova. Um, I didn't really, I didn't realize that it was out on the market now. And so um, what I found very interesting and Dennis and I have started discussing this is they, they sell it for um, $31 uh, a dried pound. So I started quickly getting my calculator out and figuring out how many times they harvested, how many tanks they had, and how much dry weight, et cetera. And um, I'm sure we could make a, a nice little profit there, Dennis. So I'm going to switch gears just to two other types of um, sea vegetables um, that we're also going to cook with today. And so one of them is called salicornia, or it's also known as sea asparagus. And so we plant, um, we plant sea asparagus and it also gets some of the nutrients from our recirculating system and that's what produces the, the nutrients that it needs to grow. And it grows from planting to this and I might have to cheat and ask Paul because I've forgotten. Where's Richard? Oh, there he is. Okay, sorry Richard, I didn't see you back there. Richard, how fast does it grow? Three months before you start cropping it. Okay, and then now I remember. And then Richard said you can take off pieces, like you can prune it like you would lettuce, and then it keeps growing, and you might be able to get, what, about three harvests from that. Yeah, okay, thanks, Richard. Um, so we're going to actually um, cook with that today as well. And um, I thought this was cool. They said, sea asparagus is the most delicious seafood you've ever had. Wow, what a headline. I mean, something like that. You guys should be lining up at Richard's door after this and asking for some. Um, and then we have this other one that's also a similar succulent plant that's called sea purslane. And this one, um, this one is planted and it grows to harvest in two to five months depending on the temperature. And so this is pretty cool. So they planted this. And then in three to five months, they had that from that same tank. So you can see how, how quickly it will grow. And that's a truckload, definitely, of sea purslane. And they ended up taking that, because um, we couldn't eat it all, they ended up taking it and using it as a restoration plant along one of our jetties um, here at Harbor Branch. OK, so how about, what do you say? Let's cook? OK. OK. So you all have your recipes there, and Brian's going to switch gears. Oh, he has already. Okay. This is the sea asparagus, and Richard and I just harvested this about two or three hours ago, so it's nice and fresh. You can see it's very uh, succulent. You can actually eat it just like this, but it's very salty. So what you'd want to do is chop it up in your salad and have it as part of your salad. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to blanch it. And we have that. And then this is, um, we also harvested some sea purslane this afternoon as well. And see, we just, we just harvested the tips of it, which are really the, the tender portion. So once again, you could chop this up too and just add it right to your salad. 
We're just going to wait till the water here boils. It shouldn't take too long. Add her on. So the recipe for this is on page two. And so it's the, it's the one that says sea asparagus and sea purslain. So what we're going to do um, with any technique where you blanch, you want to be able to cool down your, like if you're blanching carrots or broccoli or things like that, you want to blanch them just for a couple minutes so the color comes out and the vitamins come to the surface. And then you want to cool them down right away. So I've got um, some cool water here. If I was at home, you could just run them under the tap. And that would also help to cool it right down. Shouldn't be watching, because you can never get a pot to boil if you watch it, right? OK, it's getting there. It is. I think it's there. So the other thing I'm going to do is be ready to pat it dry. So put a couple of paper towels here. Okay, so the water is boiling, and who would like to be so kind as to time a minute for me? Can I have a volunteer for a minute? You will? Thank you. I'll tell you when, all right? Okay, go. Okay, it's good. When you blanch, you also want to make sure that you continue to have a steady roll of water in there. Um, if it cools down too quickly, if your vegetables are too cool, it cools down very quickly, you want to put less vegetables in because you want to keep that, that boil going. We close? Uh, 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. Oh, that's okay. Anybody have a question? Yes. Are all the nutrients the same in all of these? Um, for the sea purslane and the, and the sea asparagus, yes, they would have similar nutrients. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, ding, ding. Hold on a second. Okay, so I'm going to take them out of the water just like this. Put them over here in the cool water to cool them down right away. And then I'm going to lay them on the paper towel here. And so um, we can see that they're similar to the fresh, but they're actually a little greener, right? I don't know if you can see that on the screen, but you'll be able to see that when, um, if you come up closer. All right, let's do a few. I need another minute timed. I'm going to do a handful of. <laughs> The sea purslane as well. Yes, what's your question? It is. So the question was in in uh, uh, Long Island, Long Island uh, harvesting sea beans. You find this along the seashore. So it is the same. Sometimes they're a little fatter, um, and so they they take different forms depending on. The thick ones are difficult because they're a little bit bitter as well. Yep. Any other? Yes, sir. When, when they're in the tanks, you said there were nutrients. Are those out of the regular ocean, or do you have to put stuff in? Okay, so the nutrients that we grow these in are, are from the fish and the shrimp. So they're part of what we call our IMTA system, which is what Paul talked about. I believe it was last year, right? You talked about the IMTA. So that's our integrated multi-trophic aquaculture system, or it's what the one that has all the different species in it. And so the nutrients from that is what, what goes in. Is that ding ding? OK. OK, we can turn that off. So I'm going to cool that down in the water. If 
By the way, I want to say a special thank you to Brian, who's helping to film this today for us and show you everything that's going on. Thank you, Brian. And Jill, thank you for being back there and helping. Have you come forward, Jill? Okay, so that's done. Now we're going to get on to the fun part, and that's going to be what's all fun, right? We're going to make clam linguine. So I want to thank uh, my mom and dad and my husband Gary, who's here, who was the guinea pig <laughs> for many of these recipes. And my mom loaned me her wok. She said I have to give it back at the end of today. And I used a little bit of olive oil in the bottom. And let's see, get all my ingredients nearby. Okay, what are all the ingredients we need? We need um, garlic and some chili pepper. Scallions, got scallions. Okay, wine, yep. Okay. I know, maybe after. I can't drink on while I'm working. My boss is right here, you know. Okay. Any other questions that you're thinking about? Yep. Where do you find um, well, seaweed you can buy from the main sea, seaweed, um, so seaweed you can buy from there. Is that what you asked, seaweed, where to buy them? Yeah, consumer. consumer. Right, so um, for instance, Whole Foods would have it, or you can order it online. Yeah, Whole Foods has a pretty nice variety. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? How long does it take from uh, for a plant to, to grow uh, from uh, fertilization to harvest? So how long does it take to, I'll, I'll go ahead and repeat the question. How long does it take to grow a clam from seed to harvest? It's about 18 months. Yeah, so it's kind of a long time, isn't it? All right, so we're getting the garlic going there. While we do that, I'm going to actually get the clam water boiling again. See how much I can multitask here. More questions? Yes. Is the calcium content the same as in other leafy green vegetables or is it comparable? That's a great question. I know there's a lot of calcium in seaweed, but I don't know how comparable it is. Um, does anybody else know the answer to that? I see Paul, he's going to look it up. <laughs> All right, so. I'm going to put a little bit of chili pepper in here too. Okay, so I'm ready to start cooking the clams. I'm just going to turn that off for a minute so I don't have to keep an eye on it. In a minute, I might have to call out my sous chef. I might have to call you up, John. Mm -hmm. Come over here and help me stir fry. Okay, so I like to steam the clams. Um, so you just add a little bit of water to the bottom of the pot. And so you can see, here's the steamer, so it makes it easy. It's boiling. I don't know if you can actually see the boiling water, but it is boiling in there. So these clams, I needed to clean them um, this morning. I actually did this um, just to make sure there wasn't any, a lot of extra sand on the outside. 
And we can tell that these clams are from Cedar Key because they're slightly reddish in color, and that's because of some of the iron that's in the inshore waters. But they're very pretty, aren't they? Okay. So I have 100 clams here, so you guys can all look on the back of your chair and see if you're the lucky one that gets to try one. Okay, I think that's as many as I'm going to put in the pot right now because they're going to open up and they need some room to expand. All right, let's get back to the cooking here. I'm going to add the tomatoes next. I just Question about the seaweed. If it is growing in contaminated ocean water, does it take up the contaminants? So that's a good question, and it's really important that you buy your seaweed from a reputable seaweed uh, location because it, it could potentially take up toxins. And just like the clams are from certified waters, your seaweed also needs to be from those certified waters. <coughs> and um, I know that the seaweeds that Eden sells are really good. I know that the seaweeds that Maine Seafood sells are really good, and also the seaweeds that are grown by um, uh, out in California. So they all source their seaweed from very good waters. Are there any local uh, places that sell certified seaweed? To harvest seaweed fresh? Uh, what do you think, Dennis? Any local seaweed places? Not till we do it. Is this here in Harbor Branch? <laughs> no. Not really. They're, I mean, you usually find those seaweeds up in the colder parts of the United States and the world. Are clam raised clams safe to eat raw? Um, clams are safe to eat raw if they're from certified waters. I say that with caution. Um, I'm going to turn to Susan <laughs> to answer that question a little bit more. Okay. Well, Susan's answering that. We're going to add the scallions. By the way, I, I made the scallions um, diagonal cut, you can see. And I also like to use the little ends because I like to use all, of, all the parts of the plant. Okay, Susan. I would not advocate eating clams raw because of the potential for uh, bacterial ingestion, vibrio in particular, and gastroenteritis problems that you could encounter. So do it at your own risk. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> yes. OK, so back to cooking over here. Um, this is a seaweed called arani. And it is um, mostly found in Asian waters. Is that right, um, Dennis? I'm just checking my seaweed sacks here. It comes dried like this. It's one of my favorite seaweeds to eat. Um, you can add it. It's kind of a sweet, nutty taste. So it's, it's nice to add the dishes. So we're actually going to add it to this dish today. Um, and it has a beautiful color. I soaked it um, just a couple hours ago. It, it doesn't have to soak that long. Um, so I'm going to add that into our mixture here. It comes dried, not freeze dried, but dried. Yeah, and it's a rami. It's, it's actually in your recipe there. There, there we go. Now I see our clams are starting to pop open. Um, I don't know. Do you think you can zoom in on that, Brian? Do we have an, we have one here that's starting to pop open? Right. So we just need to be patient because a lot of clams in a big pot. How many of you have been to my cooking before? You, oh, wow, that's great. I feel like I have a following. It's nice. <laughs> so, you know I like the zest, right? Okay, so we're going to add a little zest to this. Yeah. 
It's a really nice way to add a little flavor. Okay, so our clams are really starting to go now. So that's good. We're going to keep an eye on that. We need to add a little bit of wine to this. I know you all have opinions on this, so let me know if I have added enough. What do you think? <laughs> Just what I thought. Any particular white wine? What's that? Any particular white wine? I don't know. I found this in my mom's fridge. <laughs> so, but this is uh, Chardonnay, so I, I think any white wine would be fine. What's that? She wants that back with her mom. I think she does. <laughs> A little bit of um, pepper. Oh, 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 clams popping. Okay, here we go. See, look, check it out. Got a couple here, right? Okay, they're all starting to go now. So um, I'm actually going to do something here. Get rid of this water. Okay. So this is great. See, they're all starting to pop. Um, just a couple aren't. So I'm just going to let it go for maybe maybe just another minute. Not much longer than that, though. Why do they pop? Why do they pop? Um, that's how they they just get hot and then they just just open right back, open up. But I do have a question for you. Do you know how clams communicate? By shell phone. <laughs> Megan, yes. does Felsmere still sell those delicious farm-raised shrimp? Where is the question? <laughs> right here. Delicious farm-raised shrimp in Felsmere. Do uh, they still sell no, them? No, they're not. No. Okay, so the clams are done. They, the, the place is um, being sold to another company, so I think they'll sell shrimp again, but, but not right now. Okay, so let's finish our, our dish here. You can see the clams? Okay. We need to add some basil. And I think I need to come over here. You need to add some basil and some parsley. And I'm just going to chop it um, pretty coarse because I like these spices in this particular dish um, coarse like this. Okay, what else haven't I added? Let's see. Oh, thank you. Yes, we need clam broth. So we are going to add some clam broth. See how beautiful it is? That's like the most important ingredient. Okay. Yeah. Um, you mean like cook it in it? I don't know. What do you think? Oh, yeah. yeah? No? I see some yeses and some noes. Has anybody ever tried it? I have. I mean, does it work? It does work. It does work? I've done it with, uh, when I steam my lobster in Maine. Uh huh. I'll make lobster macaroni and cheese. And I make my macaroni in the same broth as my lobster. So did you hear that? She makes macaroni and cheese, and she makes the uh, macaroni and cheese in the same water as the lobster. Is that right? Did I get that right? Yeah. OK, so pasta. I needed to cook this ahead of time. But you all know how to make pasta, right? <laughs> so this morning at 6 o'clock, I made pasta. And I think it's best, actually. This is linguine. I think it's actually. I found because there's so much sauce in here and because the pasta is cold now that it's kind of nice the pasta can pick up all these flavors. So 
So look at that, huh? Does that look good? You guys going to go home and make this tonight? <laughs> Could, could you use ramen? Ramen? <laughs> yeah, I think you could use any, I think you could use any seaweed, I mean, uh, pasta. But this is kind of the traditional way. Okay, so we're going to plate this. Let's see. Okay. Okay, and we're going to need the part of it. Okay. Oh, maybe these aren't exactly the best utensils for this job. Hold on a second. Okay, so there we go. We can add a little bit of the juice to it. And then what we're going to do is put the clams around the edge like this. And then we're going to take the salicornia that we blanched. We're going to put a couple pieces on top like this. Maybe a couple pieces of uh, porcelain. Here we go. Okay. Let's look at our time here. So, oh, it's almost five o'clock. So, <laughs> that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? So, I could just talk you through the other recipes, um, or if you want another ten more minutes, I could show you a couple more recipes. What, what's the vote here? Ten more minutes? Yeah. Okay. If anybody needs to leave, I understand. So, okay. So this is the seaweed recipe. Put this over here. Okay, so if you take a look here, this is the fresh, sorry Brian. This is the fresh seaweed that Richard and I just harvested this afternoon. The sea lettuce, right? And then this is what it looks like after a few days of drying. And we did some of the drying at room temperature and we did some of the drying um, also with, um, with the, a very low warm oven, gas oven. So, so there's two recipes here. One is for For cucumber salad, okay, so I just took the cucumber, sliced it in half, and just take a little bit of olive oil, and tamari, I add a handful of the sea lettuce, maybe even a little bit more. Actually, while I do that, I'm going to get this pan started with a little bit of sesame oil. Do you have some more questions? Is there a nutritional difference uh, between the wild and um, cultivated clams? Is there a difference between the wild yeah. and the... Uh, not really. 
Yeah, would you say there is Drifter? No, they're not really. Because the they're all grown in the same water with the same food. Oh, Tori's here from Sea Ventures. Hi, Tori. Tori, remember Sea Ventures that's starting up this week, growing clams? Tori's one of the employees. She's sitting back there with Richard. All right, so let's see. With the cucumber, I got to tell you, I had to try a lot of recipes. And the first sheet of recipes I made for you all, I had to redo because I didn't like a couple of the recipes with the sea lettuce. So I think I, I, I'm really feeling quite happy with this one. And um, so right now it has, here, I'll bring it up a little closer so Brian can get to it. So it's got the sea lettuce in it. It's got the greens of the scallions. Put that in it. Um, just add a little bit of soy sauce to it or tamari. And a little bit of sesame oil. And a bit of lemon. And I think that's all we need for that dish. A little bit of sesame seeds. So you can see how simple that was, right? Can you, you could add salt and pepper. The tamari is salty or the soy sauce is salty. But you can kind of add this to your taste. You know how you like it the best. But you could add a little bit of pepper and then sprinkle it with a little bit of sesame seeds. And there you've got a dish. So that's a pretty quick, fast dish to make, right? Okay. So one last thing, and I'll take a couple more questions while I'm making this last dish here. In, in the uh, in growing the, the seed lettuce and other things, does that appear to be uh, economically viable? Um, what do you think, um, Dennis? If Megan can't get the thirty-one dollars, <laughs> yes. So that's a good question. I we're going to seriously look closely at that. Yeah. So. All right. So you can see what I did with the dried seaweed is I put it in a little bit of sesame oil and I'm letting it cook here. And. Um, that's going to be our last dish for today. So I'll take a couple more questions, and then um, in a few minutes, if any of you want to come up and take a, take a closer look at some of the, the things that we cooked, and maybe even taste a couple things you can. For all the different sea products that you have on the table, how would you describe the taste? The taste of the sea lettuce. Well, um, the sea lettuce is, that definitely has a strong flavor, so it's nice when it's mixed in with, with things. I suppose that, um, that finishes off things today. Um, but if there's any last minute questions, I could take a couple more questions and then we'll definitely break and you can come up here and take a look at any of you that would like to.